Hello, my name is Greg Madison and welcome back to The Living Process. This is the first episode in the new season. Um, I've had a bit of a break, I've moved house, different background, and uh, I'm sure all of you have gone through many changes since uh, we were last in contact. I want to just say a little bit about this episode. Um, it's with uh, Barbara McGavin and Anne Weiser Cornell. And we are talking specifically about untangling their brand new book, which is 30 years in the making. Book. I have read it once quite quickly, and I'd like to read it again because it is absolutely full of fascinating detail that for me at least, had immediate experiential resonance and very exciting to have a book like this out that's based upon focusing but has a lot more detail and expands beyond what we normally think of as just focusing. Um, really, really interesting ideas about what a tangle is, what a part is, how parts develop. Um, how to be with a part, what would it be like if you could live from self in presence, and surprising things like uh, parts can't somehow be solved. Instead, they require a particular kind of environment. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I found it very interesting and I could easily have had three or four more uh, conversations with Barbara and Anne. Thank you very much and welcome back to The Living Process with Anne and Barbara. So welcome back to The Living Process. Uh, it's been a bit of a break, and I'm absolutely delighted that the first episode back is with Anne and Barbara, two extremely well-known people in the focusing world and beyond. And the occasion of this conversation is not only because you're both very interesting people, but also because of this brand new book that has come out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's called <laughs> Untangling, How You Can Transform What's Impossibly Stuck. And I, I found it absolutely fascinating. And I immediately want to go back and start at the beginning and go through Ooh. it again. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll concentrate mostly on what's in the book. Uh, sure. I am also conscious that Anne hasn't been on the podcast before, and we normally start by giving people an opportunity to say something about how they came into the focusing world. So I want to ask you, Anne, if you would like to do that. Yes, I'd love to. Okay. But first I want to say that today we are not Anne and Barbara, we are Barbara and Anne, because that book is by Barbara McGavin and Ann Weiser Cornell. Uh -huh. So, but yet here I am, and I did come into the focusing world a long time ago. It's now 52 years ago <laughs> that I found myself in a room in a community center and at the University of Chicago neighborhood, Hyde Park in Chicago, looking at a guy, sitting at a table at one end of the room, as if he had no bones in his body, saying, this is changes, and if you're here, you belong here. And that was Eugene Genlin and my introduction to focusing, which I could not do very well at first. But the community of people that had gathered around Gene, his psychology grad students, and the wider group that heard something cool is going on here on Sunday nights, they were irresistible. And because for the first time in my life, 
people were interested in what was inside me instead of just wanting to talk about ideas or waiting until I finished talking until they started talking. So I was hooked. I had four poor, within a week or two, I had four focusing partners <laughs> and that was it. That was how it all began. It's interesting when you tell that story, you say it was difficult for you to start with. Oh, yes. But there must have been something that made you persevere and something that brought you to that strange place with that man and his grad students. <laughs> well, earlier that year, I'd gone through a hard breakup. Oh. I realized that a longtime boyfriend was somebody I actually didn't even like. <laughs> and and in, instead of being nice and clear and honest, I got out of that relationship by hopping first into another one. And then I got to say, well, I slept with someone else, and oh, how could you do that to me, and tears and pain, and when all the and all the fuss settled down, I, then I realized, oh, I actually wanted, wanted to leave that relationship. And I did all of this. I said, wait a minute. If I were better at knowing myself, I think a lot fewer people would get hurt. <laughs> and when I met Eugene Jenlin a few months later and that community he had around him, Something in me recognized mm -hmm. what I had been looking for. A way of knowing myself well enough that maybe other people wouldn't, and me, wouldn't walk blindly into doors and things like that. It, it didn't happen immediately that I got that self-aware. <laughs> Barbara and I, in our history together, shows that. But it's been a process, and focusing is key. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. It's um, it's a moving story of how you found your way and why. Mm. Something I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. Mm. So let's talk about the book. I'm I'm curious. I, I, the first thing I'm curious about. There's a few little things I wanted to ask about, but the first thing I'm curious about is, what was the the motivation? What what was the guiding reason that the two of you decided this is something you wanted to put so much effort into? Um, I think it was that it it, it went way way back, like. Almost right from the beginning, we wanted to write a book about what we were discovering. Unfortunately, the damn thing kept moving too much all the time. Every time we, you know, we started writing it, I think at least five different times. And every time there would be, but actually, I don't know about this, and I, I, we can't articulate that yet. And what's going on there? And oh, this, this whole new area needs to be looked at and developed. And so, but so over 30 years, we gave it five different tries. And we finally, it's finally got to the point where it was staying still enough so that we could actually write about it without it changing mid-sentence as kept happening all the time. So um, but why did we want to do this? Because right from the beginning, people were asking us questions and we had something that we had that we said that was meaningful for people and was helpful for people. And we wanted to be able to share it with as wide a community of people as possible. So that meant you know, you got to write a book. So uh, we, we, you know, as, as you can see, we finally got there. But even as we speak, there are still things that are becoming clearer. And, you know, it's never going to actually completely stay still. But the, the solid bones of it are there. The, 
what really matters and what will help people, I think, is, is now in a form where it can be shared with a wide bunch of people. So mm-hmm. that's why. Oh, that's a good enough answer. Anything I'll just to add? add well, I will add this process is life changing. It's an application of focusing to really tough, stuck areas of life. We were encountering our own stuck areas of life. We didn't think we'd invent something anybody else could use. All we wanted to do was Mm -hmm. feel more free ourselves of the ways we were stuck. But then it turned out we couldn't because of the questions people asked us. We couldn't resist sharing what we were discovering and they loved it. And they said, when are you going to teach this? Mm-hmm. So, and then it started changing other people's lives too. It's, it is irresistible to, to share. Yeah. We were sharing it to groups of 20 at a time for 30 years, but it really wanted to be shared more widely. Yeah. So as Barbara says, got to be a book. That one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is that phenomenological aspect of it, that it actually comes from your own experiencing process. It doesn't come from someone's theory that you're trying to fit into. It comes from what you found actually works. Mm. And the stories that you tell throughout the book make that really clear. Um, I really appreciated that. And it reminded me of something I said to both of you many years ago when you were calling it Treasure Maps to the Soul, that it's a paradigm. It feels like this is a whole paradigm. It's a whole understanding. It's a whole approach that includes, this is what I would say, so I'm curious if you would agree, includes uh, focusing, is based upon focusing, but also includes so much more specificity and so much more detail than focusing itself encompasses. Is that how you see it? Yeah, it's it's very um, like focusing is. We could say it's it's the engine, mm-hmm. or the, it's it's that underlying process that can be applied absolutely anywhere in life. And Mm -hmm. we have just taken it and looked at really specific things and how focusing um, applies or how focusing uh, shows up or how focusing supports or what, um, what it is that needs attention in very specific ways and we brought that very all of all that focusing is together with what we were developing which was now called inner relationship focusing because you know really looking at how that relationship that one can have with one's inner experiencing really matters i love it Greg, that you pointed to how, what did you call it? Phenomenological. Yes. How our work comes first from experiential process. And in fact, our own. Mm -hmm. It's very grounded there. And in one early version of this book, we were going to put in lots of stories from our different students, people who'd worked with us and had shared and be willing to share what they went through. And I believe it was Barbara who looked at it and and said, no, we need to tell our own stories. There are a few stories of other people in the book, but it's primarily us. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and the reason was, these are the stories we know from the inside that we can tell in the detail that's needed for people to really get it. And (laughs) Barbara and I, both had at least three major tangles to tell about. So our own experience provides many, many examples for the book. And I'm I'm proud of that. There is theory, but experiencing Mm -hmm. came first. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I really liked that you used your own life uh, tangles 
because it gave it a continuity. You could keep coming back to a particular issue from a different angle, which I found that very useful. Um, one of the things that I was curious about was the the word part and the the working with parts is such a fundamental aspect of this and it's interesting to me first of all i'm wondering if you could say something about how parts and i know you do address this in the book how parts come about why is there such a thing as parts Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. How parts come about and why there are such a thing as parts. Okay. Well, when we are interacting in the world, And there is no impediment, one could say, or any impediment that you find you can you can deal with, you can engage with it, and you can go forward. There are there's no parts there. You are just living and engaging in life and moving forward. However, sometimes, especially when we're little kids, but not always, sometimes there are situations. Where you find yourself up against an, an, an a wall, so to speak, where you cannot go forward. It is impossible to go forward. And every time you come up with some come up against something like that, there is a response to that, a reaction to that. It could it feels you feel something in your body. It's frustrating. It's like a mm. So there is a bodily experience of being stuck at that point. Now, that in and of itself is not necessarily traumatic. It's just an experience of that. It, I, I failed to do this. I, I cannot do this. But if you have that response to it, and then somebody tells you, shut up, or somebody punishes you, for your reaction to that situation, you've got something else happening. Mm -hmm. There is, then you have to deal with that. So you have an emotional response and somebody goes, yeah, I know, I really understand. That's really frustrating. It's just a frustrating experience. And so you're okay. But if somebody goes, I'll give you something to cry about that, then you have then you've got trauma, then you've got something that you that you then have to squelch your experience or you have to fight back and, and scream even louder or something, but it's no longer all of you just engaging in the situation. Mm -hmm. At that point, something usually splits and something is available in the outside world and something gets hidden. An aspect of who you are gets turned in on itself. And there's all sorts of ramifications from that. Like there's other parts that then go, well, we're got to make sure that nobody ever knows about this because it's really shameful to be upset or to be um, hurt or whatever. So there's that kind of layer. So there's layer upon layer of different kinds of reactions and responses to dealing with the aftermath of the, the split, so to speak, that in ordinary life, you can, you can have failure and it's fine. You're okay. You stay whole. And then there are instances where you have some kind of failure and it's not okay because of what happens after the failure to be able to move forward. It's the It takes aftermath. two failures to make a stoppage that turns yeah. that that turns into a tangle in which parts have to take different roles Arise. and the whole self is no longer available available yeah and, and what actually for us the word part I don't even think this is in the book but for the word part also is short for partial self process yeah okay. so it's a part is always partial it's never the yeah. whole self. And it's also a part of self. It isn't 
some kind of extraneous thing. It is actually part of who you are and still carries both the unlived forward wanting to go forward and also the unlived pain because that's part of what happens at that origin spot is that there was pain which could not be fully felt there was some experience which could not be fully expressed and that got stopped that got stopped so part of what we're doing in this is creating an environment in which mm -hmm. those kinds of experiences can be completed can finish so that then you can go on to whatever the next living forward step would be can I just of your say, life as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go so, ahead. Can I say it back? I, I mean, you, you're sure. saying a lot that I find absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is the importance of providing a particular environment. I'm very curious. Absolutely. About that. But first, I want to say back something more of what you were just talking about. And I, I know already that I'm missing some of it. But I'm, and I'm, I want to say it back in a, in a different way than you did to, to find out what you think of this, okay. whether I've got it or if I've misunderstood. It, so what happens in life? And this happens to everyone. This is a, this is a facet of human life. This isn't a failure mm -hmm. of living. This is how we live. We don't, it's not possible for us to go through life, just everything that's implied is carried forward and, and everything in this paradise of earth meets our needs and it just we just flow from birth to death. That's not what happens. Uh, and if that did happen, we would not grow. We would not become competent human beings. We yeah. need yes. difficulty and failure to engage yes. with that in order to grow. Okay. Well, go that's ahead. that's that's a that's another curious aspect of it is who would we be if that happened? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Um, that isn't what happens. What happens is of necessity we meet these situations that are frustrating that might cause a stoppage. The stoppage is if it's frustrating. If I understood you and. If it's frustrating, and then there's another reaction to the frustration that almost makes it into a knot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, we need a second. We need, we need, we need not just for life to flow forward, mm -hmm. but then when life doesn't flow forward, we need an environment which allows us to, let's say, process that. Yes, and it's that it's what that second failure, the second missing, the lack of that, that results in a stoppage that stays in the body, and has to be dealt with by creating parts and being a tangle. That was the other thing that I wanted to say: is parts are created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, parts yeah. form. We're not born with them. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. parts our process. So yeah. parts are not entities that are fixed and we don't believe in giving them names mm -hmm. because that adds to the misunderstanding that they are fixed. Parts are process. They are process that is repetitive. In the process model, mm -hmm. Jenlin tells, gives the metaphor of a fly buzzing against a window that the fly can't get through. And that's in the section where he's talking about when a process can't carry forward to its next step, it repeats the last possible sequence. Mm -hmm. And that gave us the idea that that's what a part is. It's a repetition of the last possible sequence. A part is actually a repetition. And and While yet, it attempts to get through the window. It, it, it's a, there is a kind of failure to that repetition. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's absolutely. waiting for the possibility of actual forward movement. And so far, it hasn't happened. So many, there's lots of actions that we take when we're identified with parts. But none of them succeeds in carrying forward our life. Yeah, exactly. So we get into this sort of frustrating, you know, I, I can never get enough 
love and sex, or I can never get enough satisfying food to eat, or my I, I don't ever, and so on. And I can never get enough appreciation to finally feel like I'm worthwhile. There's this not enoughness because something is not carrying through. The other thing I wanted to say in response to that, what you're just saying now, Anne, is um, when I was reading the book and reflecting on my own life, it felt to me like these stoppages or tangles, they have an experience of narrowing down. Yes. Mm -hmm. You you feel like your life is has somehow become constricted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And in the book, it sounds like one response to that is to be able to explore the different parts in the constriction. There's always at least two, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another possibility, and you didn't say it this way in the book, but it reminded me of kind of, of like stepping back and getting a sense of the whole thing. Now, there's something... It, it it felt almost like to me that it was a a return to sort of a, a more traditional kind of getting oh. enough distance to feel the whole thing, uh, letting mm -hmm. a felt sense form. My question as I was reading is when, like, what is the difference between sort of sensing um, the way forward using parts and sensing the way forward using the whole? Well, one simple way to say it is that if you have so, if you are so caught up in parts that they're not letting you go, you not you're not going to be able to get a sense of the whole. Yeah. And way back when this work first came to us, when we first discovered and developed it, it was in those areas where focusing hadn't been working for us. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was in ourselves and others that but I don't like this, so I'm going to set it out. Mm -hmm. You're not getting a felt sense if you are not that environment of acceptance and spaciousness where a felt sense can come. Yeah. So parts were interfering with getting felt senses. And we felt we have to do parts work or we can't get felt senses of these challenging areas. So you, you're pointing to our step. We have five, we call them powers. And the, the fifth one is getting a felt sense of the whole thing. Hmm. Well, all of the powers sort of exist at the same time, but there's a reason why we made that the fifth one because it really isn't possible to go directly there if you're caught up in parts. Yeah. If you're identified with them. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to say that back because that, that feels much clearer to me and also really important. Mm. Um, that sometimes when you go to focus, you are so trapped within a tangle yeah, you're yep. so with you're so in it that the only possibility yeah. is to work from within it, mm. and that and that well, means, you, you wouldn't say it that to way. work with being within it. Yeah, to work <laughs> with being within it. You still have to, even at the very beginning of being with parts, you still have to be not yeah the part. Yes, but yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You have to be in their neighborhood in order to get to know them. <laughs> you can't sort of right. jump out and be in some other city. You really have okay. to start from where they are, but not, there you go. not be them. Yeah. yeah. And that's why the, the first power, which we call the power of cultivating self and presence, is the most important and actually all of the powers are elaborations or specifications of self and presence, of cultivating self and presence, of, you know, like whether it's the power of and where we 
include everything. So it's horizontal and widens things out. Like, oh, yes, there's that part. Oh, and there's that part. And yeah, okay. Hello, I can see that you're there too. And mm -hmm. I'm creating this wider and wider space because, as you said, being inside a tangle is very narrow. So we widen ourselves and we widen the space within which all these different aspects of a tangle can be contained. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, empathy, deep empathy, which is about being really in touch with particular uh, parts in an empathic way. And then these other two. So we have sort of two broad aspects. One is, we could call it relational. And the other, uh, so being able to relate to parts individually. And then felt sensing, which is this really important you know, it's it's the underlying mm. engine, the underlying focusing, yeah. which is in the last two hours. But they're all aspects of self and presence. Without self and presence, the felt sensing doesn't really work very well because you're relating to something from the place of, yeah. from the viewpoint of a part, which yeah. is always narrow. Yeah. So. Yeah, I found that really exciting and another thing about the book is that every once in a while you 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 write in it something that is so kind of clear and simply said and then suddenly so obvious <laughs> but not, not something i had ever seen before and one example of that is if i have it right you say um a tangle is something that cannot be solved. I love that. I That's love the point it. in the book where we say, do you want to throw the book across the room right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It can it cannot be solved. Like it cannot be, you mm -hmm. can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. You can't. You know, move things around and oh yeah okay I'm 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 going to fix this it's it's mm -hmm. a tangle is unfixable you cannot fix mm -hmm. it you cannot solve it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and my sense of it was almost that that's not what's needed even though that's our usual <laughs> approach to everything is to try to fix it or mm -hmm. solve it or understand it or find yeah. the even understanding it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not needed no. But what you're saying is needed is, as you said a little while ago, is this particular kind of environment. Yeah. Can you say more about that? That seems so fundamental. Right. Well, you know, Gentlin said in his book, Focusing, focusing requires a friendly attitude to what comes. And then... If somebody had said to him, but what if I can't be friendly to it? He said, well, then see if you can be friendly to that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something we've elaborated. We've realized, yes, you can start by sitting with what you feel, sensing what you feel, describing what you feel, saying hello to what you feel. But with what? Who's doing all of that? From where? What's the quality of that? Who is the self who is doing those things? And that's really important. The more you realize that parts exist, you realize that, okay, <clears throat> well, I'm going to uh, sit with what I feel, and I'm going to describe it, and uh, then I'm going to ask it what it needs to feel better. <laughs> so wait a minute that actually isn't going to work at all because that's not the curious, warm, compassionate, open place from which this is going to, this whole focusing thing is going to work. So it, many people have observed this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kevin, Kevin, right. Kevin says it's when the parts of the body are loved by the whole body. That's when yeah. they become they awaken into their own healing. So people, yeah. everybody, I mean, who knows, everybody, every focuser knows this. Mm -hmm. But we call it self in presence. 
and we mm. we've developed very some specific ways of being able to support that happening we you know like we in our in the first um power we call it there are there are three different ways there's we call it resourcing and recognizing and relating and that gives three really easy to understand or at least we hope they're easy to understand ways of being able to really strengthen your ability to create this environment through taking care of yourself resourcing in all sorts of different ways whatever that is from listening to music to walking in nature to getting good sleep to uh just sitting and feeling your your butt under you as you're sitting here you know all of those are are really good ways to resource um and recognizing that capacity to go um i think i just got part c there which is like <laughs> really being being able to spot oh i am not at the moment really in this space of open curiosity and i can acknowledge that i don't have to change it all i have to do is acknowledge that and then i can relate to whatever part is there that needs my attention i can i can bring my capacity to be with in a very deliberate way very specific way so we developed this thing called self and presence it's not really a surprise we we called it many things when we decided to call it self in presence it's a very odd phrase again following jen Lin's advice don't give something a simple name give it a give it an odd name so that people have to ask what you mean by it <laughs> and so before we called it presence for for years and then people would assume they knew what we meant and oh there's presence over in this method and there's presence over in this method mm -hmm. Yeah. self in presence yeah but self in presence is me in other words we we recommend that people identify with self in presence that they don't think of that as a as something you have to go look for or create or conjure up that you you speak from that self i am sensing I am aware. I am noticed. Yeah. And what is that eye? Is it just the... Don't look at your own eye. You're going to get neck strain. <laughs> your, <laughs> your eyes will rotate in your head. <laughs> it's a, it's Sometimes a we say it's, it's... Yeah. It's process. It's the capacity to interact to interact it's the ability it's yeah the ability to be with anything inside you so that's it and to engage in life you know well, it's dangerous to say what things it. are yeah. <laughs> yes yeah. yeah and yet it's it's pointing to something that um feels it has a particular quality mm -hmm. um it i you guess talk too much about his quality though you can fool yourself i mean we talk about how being self in presence can feel calm and yet you can be self in presence and not feel calm yeah <laughs> if your body is full of of anxiety that doesn't mean you're not self in presence as long as you are aware of that and you're being with that and you're acknowledging that mm -hmm. so something so, in you can be like, really anxious and you uh you can still be say in a state of self in presence yeah self in presence is implies a consciousness of your experience or something if you want to yeah, uh, it is a kind of awareness yeah. you know i i've got a paragraph here i want to read to you read to everybody people sometimes say to us you brought in parts Jenlin didn't have parts mm -hmm. well we did discover parts but then we discovered that Jenlin had parts too and on page 35 of focusing oriented psychotherapy he says this she's he's describing a session he says as she senses this all good part of her she is moved by it 
and has sympathy and understanding for it. And yet, let us observe carefully, herself is not this part or any other part of content. Rather, she is the one who senses it, can speak for it, understands it, and senses it. The self is not any specific content. Mm -hmm. So that's the self that we're talking about. Yeah. That, so that's that, another way mm -hmm. of describing the I. Right. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things it makes me wonder about is why is it that um, these parts need this particular kind of environment? What is it about? Because you call it love at, in, in some places. Why, what is so magical about love? Or what well, the about? simple answer is that's what they were missing. That's mm -hmm. why they got the parts were created because that was missing at the time. Let's see what Barbara wants course, to add. Of course, love can be expressed in many different ways. Mm -hmm. It's and so love in this context is sensing how this part needs me to be with it. Sensing what kind of connection it needs from me right now, here. And that can that can take many, many different forms. It isn't just, oh darling, I so <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be all all soft and and because sometimes what a part needs is yeah, it, it, sometimes it needs a, a bit of truth. Sometimes it needs um, a bit of a challenge. Sometimes it needs uh, something that's more, I don't know, more engaging somehow. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to say it very well. But, but it isn't just all about, there, there, dear. No, it can, it can also be giving it the opportunity, giving a part the opportunity to really, really hurt. Mm -hmm. Because what was missing was the that that opportunity to be able to feel, endure, go through, complete an experience that was really painful. A lot of times, what a part does is. It tries to get away from or shut down painful experiences. Mm -hmm. But an environment which makes it possible to actually feel those and complete them. You know, it might be just completing, experiencing it directly, or it might be completing an expression of something. Mm -hmm. But that's, um, but that is also love to be able to not jump in, rescue, mm -hmm. or try to take somebody or some a part of you away from. Because that's what other parts do, is that there is something that is painful, and another part comes along and says, chocolate, chocolate's good, you know. Eat some more chocolate. You won't feel so bad. But it doesn't allow a completion. So. Yeah. And that's love. Love is being able to stay with something that is difficult yeah. all the way through. To be able to bear it, to be strong enough that it can be felt. Yeah. With yeah. acceptance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a loving kind of strength. It's not a stony yeah. kind of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a stoical. It's a... Yeah. yeah. It's like holding the hand of someone who's in the hospital. You're, you're there. 
Mm -hmm. Even if they're hurting, you are there. Yeah. Yeah. There's another thing that you, 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 you say it in a particular way in the book, um, which it reminded me of the kind of um, the action step that's sort of hovers on the edge of focusing, but doesn't seem to be have a central <laughs> place in focusing. But the way that you say it, and you might not feel that it's the same as the action step, is uh, there's a couple of examples in the book where you say you encourage the person at a particular point to then reflect, like, what's possible now that wasn't possible before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the last how, line of the book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that the last line of the book? Yeah, yeah I think it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I really like that because it, it it felt almost like, you know, can you live differently now? It, and it's mm -hmm. it had the implication of an action step while being much broader somehow. Yeah. Well, you know, a tangle is a restriction in possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when tangles untangle, possibilities multiply. Yeah, and sometimes they are dramatically different. Sometimes, like, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, you might even have amnesia. It changes so completely. Mm -hmm. but, that there was ever a problem. Amnesia. There was, did I have a problem with that? Be because what we observe, and we tell stories about this, is that the change that comes after the tangle shifts doesn't have to be decided on or resolved on or... Yeah. You know, it's just, oh, I found myself behaving really differently yeah. in ways yeah. I couldn't have before. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 I love that. It's because you're now a different person. Yeah. You have a different body. Yeah. There is, a, there is a whole, I mean, you know, I'm speculating, but there has to be a whole restructuring of neural connections that go on. And I, and I think it's that when things shift in a tangle, it uses up so much less energy than being entangled. Being entangled, mm -hmm. like there's a lot going on. There's a lot of energy and this is trying to control that and that is holding on to that. And, like, and in all of that, you're still trying to live forward, which is really effortful and I, all of that takes up a huge amount of energy. And then when it shifts, it's like, oh, it simplifies masses of stuff. So there's a whole bunch more energy available and things that were difficult aren't upsetting anymore. And mm -hmm. All of that. I was just going to say we call our online course Getting Free. The yeah. online course on untangling for advanced focusers. Mm. Because getting free is our best way of describing the result. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's That was interesting to me in the book, near the end, where you kind of touch on what is it like when you work in this way and you make progress in this way and kind of yeah. what is the new life like? Mm -hmm. that was interesting and for me you I, I th as as far as i can remember you shy away from or maybe you don't even shy away from it maybe it's just for a, a good reason you don't put it in but i felt at the 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 end part that it it felt very expansive to read that and i was it for me, at least when I was reading it, it felt like it has some kind of almost slightly spiritual implication in some way, almost like it's something about being more in tune with life or something about being able to go with the flow more easily. But then <laughs> there is this kind of uh, surprising statement that the parts may still all be there. They don't just... Right. 
they don't go away necessarily or disappear and that Not was necessarily. yeah it was uh, maybe you could say something about that it was it, it makes Well, sense but you're, you thought it was your parts <laughs> that were keeping you from whatever yes or making you do so much of whatever, but uh, it's not that the parts make you do that. It's that there wasn't enough self in presence in the system so that it's from the self that decisions happen. So you're listening, let's say writer's block, right? I'm listening to the part of me that doesn't want to write. And it and it reveals some of the reasons that it hasn't been wanting to write, like it didn't want to have be critic be criticized by other people and so on. But then logic tells us that that's the part we have to convince that now it's okay to and safe to write. Oh no. That part doesn't have to be convinced of anything. No part ever has to be convinced of anything. No part ever has to change. And you see how that is a whole different way of looking at it. It's that I'm now going to be the one that writes. I'm going to step in. And without any effort, now the seat of choice is here in the self. So self is not only a state of compassion toward parts it's also a way of living life so it's one way of understanding this work is you're cultivating more and more space in a way mm -hmm. yeah it sounds good and the other thing to say is that when you're inside a tangle you have a particular idea of how things will be when the tangle isn't there anymore yeah Yeah. And no, this is process. On the other side of untangling, no one knows what that will be like. That's, I think, part of what you're reading in our stories in the last chapters is we don't always say she had this problem and now she doesn't anymore. And now she, it's, 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 it's fuzzier than that. Because how it feels on the other side is is like freedom. Mm -hmm. yeah how how you actually live forward is you cannot know because that's actually a fantasy that was created out of the difficulty that was in the past So when it shifts forward, it sh lives forward now, where you are now, in this particular life, in this context, at this moment. And it keeps, it can keep changing. So what, when you're living forward and something has shifted, it might be that yes, okay, writing is easier or writing is easy now and I don't want to write. <laughs> yeah. So, but in the past, the only successful outcome would have been I am now writing. But you don't know what the, the right next step will be until it unfolds in the living in the living moment, in, in the actual moment. That, that's, that's something that took a long time for me to really grasp, to really get, that I have no idea. And it is, it, that's what's really impossible. It is impossible for me, me to know what the right next step will be until it unfolds, until I live it. And then I'll know, because it will have lived itself. Yeah. And that's very freeing. Yes. But that again is where it touches on something that has a kind of a small s spirituality to it for me. Right. Do you mean And then... because there's a kind of faith involved? Or say more. 
Yeah, there is a kind of a trust implied, um, but no, it isn't that as much as um, the feeling almost that there's something, well, one way that the gene used to say it is that life is living us, that there is something living us mm -hmm. in some way. There's something that's guiding um, what really would be right. No matter yeah. how much we think we know what would be right, we can't mm -hmm. just make that be true. Mm -hmm. That there's something else that we have, we really do have to take account of in order to expand and be um, congruent with what would be right. But let's not but let's not speak as if that's other than us. When you say something else, I'm I'm not sure I would go along with that. Life wants to live is what I remember Gene saying. Yeah. And we and his whole theory about the implicit what's what implying is and implying into occurring is carrying forward yeah but you don't know what carrying forward will be before it happens you only know carrying forward when it has happened and it changes the implying yes and that's that's really all we're saying yes is that you don't know what will be what untangled will feel like until it happens. And yeah. then, because it's changed the implying, you know yeah. it. Every, everything alive has implying. And although you can say that's spiritual because you can, you're can you talking about everything alive and, and how we're really kind of all one system as well, and there's implying of the whole thing, I don't think it's uh, spiritual in the sense of being separate from observation no. and Experience. biology and so on experiencing yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but it is separate from the i that i may be identified with the well that's the thing yeah well, i'm not sure it is okay because otherwise no what what separate no i'm not separate I mean, I can say I'm separate if I look at it one way, but on the other hand, I am I am of the intricate, interactive mesh that is all living things. Everything interacts all the time. Yeah. Separate is the wrong word, but there is a yes. there is a distinction. <laughs> between okay. um, a part and self and presence. That we don't we agree, just... don't disagree with. We'd agree with that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And from self in presence, it is more likely that a felt sense or a part will process itself in a particular direction towards more aliveness, you might say. Mm -hmm. And less partsiness. And less mm -hmm. partsiness, yeah. Right. That's what I'm referring to, is that okay. living forward, that mm. I can't, I, I mean, you could say, to some extent, I have to get out of the way enough to allow that to happen, because the eye that would get in the way of it is a partsy eye. There you go. Yeah. We'd agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, that has yeah. uh, that has some deeper sense that is not separate from me. That, uh, but somehow mm -hmm. knows me better than mm -hmm. the part C me that tries to orchestrate yeah. things. Mm -hmm. I think many many of the world's religions and philosophies advise us. Uh, be careful when you make plans <laughs> mm -hmm. <Thank> you. <laughs> because uncertainty yeah. is what's true 
And this is a way of saying that uncertainty may be true, but it doesn't mean, and at the same time, life lives forward. Yes. So there is a wisdom of next steps built into us. And by pausing and tuning into that, we get closer both to ourselves and to our connections with everybody else. Yeah. That's a good, that's good news. Yeah. And it's not something that we need to define. Exactly. We can live it. Yeah, exactly. We can live it and we could call it something different every day. Mm -hmm. um, when I was reading the book, it was an interesting... It didn't feel like a self-help book, but it felt like it was self-helpful. <laughs> say it that way. Uh, I should quote you on that. <laughs> um, the thing that was interesting to me, one of the things interesting to me was it, I could read the book without knowing focusing. I could read the book and I could read it from beginning to end and I could have a sense of this process and how to change. And yet I don't feel like I was taught steps. I like that. That's all intentional. That's yeah. how we <laughs> plan to write it. <laughs> I really, I really appreciated that. The mm -hmm. other thing I appreciated, but I had a question about when I, I didn't even realize it until I finished the book, mm -hmm. was it's also written in a way that I can pick it up and do it myself. Mm -hmm. it's okay. not written in a way that you now should go and find someone else that's read the book and sit down with them because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. Well, I think some people, use... that might be different for some people. Like yeah. if you do. already have a focusing background, yeah. then uh, you may be able to pick it up and do it yourself. And yeah, we know that there are people who are going to need more than that. But, but if, if yeah, your point we'll is go. that the book gives the message that people can do it themselves, okay. And yeah. we do yeah. say in the preface, you know, you may want to read this with a friend. And then at the very end, under resources, we say, here are some courses that may give you some support. Yeah. But this, yes, the spirit of the book we really, really tried not to use focusing jargon and not to speak in such a way that we narrow our audience to people who already knew knew us and knew what we were talking about. It was a big, big effort that we made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, successful. I thought really successful. Mm, um, great. Yeah. I, the, the last thing that I wanted to ask about, which doesn't really fit here, is um, it's another example of one of these pithy little statements that uh, almost were, you know, really, well, really struck me. And that was that tangles always involve other people. Oh, yeah. I thought that was <laughs> really, really interesting. And I tried to think of an exception to that. And one doesn't come to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, I mean, we looked at a lot of different tangles. And even though ostensibly they can seem like it's all just my stuff and it's me and my problem. But as soon as you start sensing into the different parts that are involved, as soon as you start sensing what was going on for them, then it's either people in the past mm -hmm. or people now somehow like or people in the future <laughs> or even people yeah. in the future yeah. yeah yeah and it has to do with interaction with others mm -hmm. in some way we are interactional interaction we're social first. yeah nobody does this alone yeah yeah mm -hmm. all anything that has to do with shame and and tangles are full of shame has to do with other people. 
as a psychotherapist, it was interesting to read it because there were times I was um, thinking about practice with another person. Mm -hmm. Good. Help, you know, yeah, helping someone else as much as I can by being the environment that was needed rather than Yeah. trying to be the helpful uh, person getting in there trying to fix something instead simply being that missing environment. Mm -hmm. I bet you do that. I think sometimes I do that, but I don't. <laughs> Um, but it's certainly and both are like, and sometimes the environment that's needed is getting in there and providing not just a kind of passive environment, yeah. No, but no. an, an active environment. Yeah. Yes, active in a very particular way. I would say there's Active constant in a very being particular active. way. Yeah. Um, and the the implication of that for me is. that sometimes it's, and I would say this in my own life, I, I, you know, we, maybe I've all run across people that do this for us, even strangers who temporarily do it. It's through someone else's uh, providing that kind of care and attentiveness that we can come into that relationship with ourselves. It's like, sometimes it is so difficult to do it on our own that it's just Mm -hmm. it's almost like someone brings this warm bath to us and within that we kind of can begin to relax and pay attention to ourselves but it has to come sometimes it feels like through that interaction yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think i think that's one of the things that therapists are important for mm -hmm. In a, in a world where I hope that many people will be focus, focusing partners and that focusing partnership will be a community wellness model, we will still need therapists when people cannot be self in presence Yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that then the therapy environment is a place where they can experience that and begin to develop their own ability to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. That certainly is in the background when I'm working with someone is is looking for that development in them so that when they finish with me, Mm they -hmm. go out into the world in a different kind of relationship with themselves. Yeah. Yes. and the people around them, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So before we finish, can I just ask if there's anything either of you would like to add, something that you particularly feel passionate about in the book or what comes next? Or what's been already developed and didn't make it into the book? Because <laughs> I'm sure it can be. <laughs> well, we're continuing to look at different ways that we can share this work with people. And one of the things we're doing is, is developing uh, an online on-demand course so that people could um, take it whenever they want. Because at the moment, you know, What we have available is is fairly limited. It's limited in terms of the number of people that can do it, and and in terms of the times. Like you know, getting free takes a whole year, and we we only have a certain number of people that we can have there, and and our retreats there are only so many people. So that's one of the things that we're wanting to do is to, is to open up other opportunities to be able to people to be able to learn it for themselves, to really get it for themselves, and and to get into community with it. That's where we are at the moment. It's been a big, big deal to finally have this book out. Yeah. 30 years in the making, we like to say. Yeah. And And the last three I'm still in particular. <laughs> very intensively the last three. Oh, my Yeah. gosh. And I'm still getting used to the space in my life that where the where having to always be thinking of the book and getting it written Mm -hmm. Yeah. used to be Mm -hmm. Like it. not even not even sure what's next but it'll be more you know we're we want to continue to support this work in all kinds of ways Yeah. And support people in really being able to 
to have it for themselves. And um, one of the, the things that was so important to me about learning focusing was that I could really take responsibility for my own inner life, my own inner growth and healing. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something that's always been important to me and, and I continue to to really want to support is is people being able to go, yeah, I can do this. I know how to do this. I know how to do this for myself. I know how to do this with other people as pairs, as as a peer partnership. So all of that's really important to me. And yes, of course, therapists are really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's part of it is being able to know. Yeah, I I need to be with somebody who can hold the space for me mm -hmm. in that way. So all of that. Greg, thank you for your yeah careful oh, reading and your picking out key phrases. And it's been really interesting and fun to talk to you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I hope it gets it's us doing well. way out. It's doing well. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good to hear. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you so Bye. much. And thank you so much. A pleasure. pleasure. Yep. Bye. See you around. Yep. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.